Kyle Bass, Haven Capital uh, founder uh, and CIO. And uh, it, no, none of this is surprising, I guess, is it, after all, all your previous appearances? It's taken a long time. But, you know, even Xi Jinping bans Teslas from the cities that he, that he travels to in China because he's afraid of Teslas surveilling him. So whether it's the guilty conscience or the fact that all of these connected cars can transmit data, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're just, we're, it looks like we're going to enter into some reciprocal action, which is what I'm a huge proponent of. After all the appearances you've had, I, um, I don't think we've ever talked about dumping and just, just the way China approaches global trade. And now it's going to happen, or, or there's no reason it, it's not going to happen with, with these vehicles, the BYD vehicles. We had Phil LeBeau down in Chile. So that, that's another thing we have to worry. They don't, they don't do anything in our interests, do they, China? They, their, their goal is global primacy at all costs. Are you sure? That, so you just say that. that that's yeah, true. For, for sure. But look back to our tariffs. And I know these are Trump tariffs, but they're, they're still here in the Biden era. The 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum. When, when China wants to act, let's say, uneconomically or non-economically, they can produce things and give away electricity or give away materials and then flood our market, ruin our capacity to produce. And then we rely on them for production once they ruin our capacity. So those tariffs were defensive tariffs, and they stayed on for a reason. I know in the beginning they said, well, Trump this and Trump that. The tariffs were driven by Bob Lighthizer and some really smart people, and they stay in place. The 232 tariffs, the 301 tariffs, they're all still there, and they're there for a reason. And the cars are just another iteration of they could dump in their cars into our market and, and put our big three out of business if they want to act. They could sell cars at a loss if they had to for a few years because we run uh, economically and they can run, a state actor can run without economics right. in mind. This is the way they build real estate and stadiums and everything else. They can do all those things, right? It's because it's non-economic. It's, it's, it's done for a reason. What, what do you make of the idea that we were talking with, uh, with Froman earlier about just competition in the U.S. And we were making the argument about car, this is about cars, bringing cars into our country. You know, Elon Musk will tell you that BYD cars are pretty great. I don't know if you think that's true or not, but one of the reasons I think that some people have a view that EVs are not having a, as big a take up as you might imagine is that the product itself is not that great. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I own two Teslas. I, I bought them early, and they're just, for me, uh, they don't, they're not my my day-to-day uh, uh, -day driver because if I need to go two or three cities away, right. I don't want to worry myself about where the next charger is. And when you, even in Palo Alto, where, where I had one, you know, you have to sit at the shopping center in Palo Alto for half an hour and you have to wait in line for a charger. Right. Like, it's not like going to the gas station for two minutes and filling up and leaving. So, right. like, there are only specific use cases that work. And if you're just driving in a short distance and plugging at home, I get it. But it, it can't be your daily driver, and especially in places that have more rural areas. Uh, so, so do you uh, think that yeah, the whole EV thing is, is, is just a fallacy? What, say again? That the, that the EV, the market for EVs, over call it even the next 10 years, is a fallacy. Because you will never get, it is unlikely that you're going to get the battery to really extend over the next 10 years in a way that may solve the problem you're talking about. Correct. I mean, you know, in, in my case, the stated mileage set would say 232 on a full charge. I could get about 100 miles. Um, really? So that was early. Uh, now they've gotten better since then. But I won't buy another one. Um, I won't buy another one probably as long as I live. So Really? Yeah, because, like, I, I drive an hour and a half, two hours, and... To, to a ranch or to a, a property. We have eight properties around the state in our business. Like, no way am I going to drive an electric vehicle to do so, that. So I just, I just can't do it. I was going to, one question would be, when's the last time China did something that seemed nice or conciliatory towards the United States? I don't think you could come up with anything. So I'm not going to ask you that. The, the, Andrew, the, the, this is in the journal once again, yep. but it's the former science editor of the New York Times. Okay. Who's saying that not only do documents now show that, that the virus, COVID, came from the lab, but it was, I don't know how this is new, but the laboratory actually developed the virus. I, I guess they're implying that it wasn't just a complete fluke or, or accidental, but it was part of the gain-of-function research to test these things. Now, it's still a leap to say that it was released on purpose and, and sent to the rest of the world on purpose, but is that, are we ever headed there? 
I, look, okay, I'll give you a theory I have. It's, it's, really, it's really simple. At the peak of Hong Kong's protests, at the peak of the Chinese Communist Party's existential threat to their relationship with Hong Kong and protesters, they couldn't just roll tanks in there like they did in Tiananmen Square because Hong Kong was, was hugely connected. So we would see everything on video and audio and, you know, uh, and at that peak, at the same time China's current account, their kind of net income account was headed towards zero because they were traveling, you know, they had 450,000 students here. They were traveling and spending abroad and all of that traveling and spending is in dollars. So their current account was headed towards zero. Their Hong Kong protests were at a peak, at a zenith and magically COVID showed up. And what did it do? It allowed them to take over Hong Kong without a shot fired. And their current account went up $450 billion overnight. Now. Maybe it was just a pure coincidence. Maybe it was great luck on the Communist Party's part. Maybe it was not. I don't know. No one will ever know, right? We'll never know. But if you look at the emails between Fauci and Collins, which you look at them under FOIA, it's obvious that there was a cover-up that went on uh, where we didn't want to blame them right away. We didn't even want to entertain the thought that not that was after a possibility. We, not after the NIH. Had so funded, I think the fact yeah. that we didn't want to even have it as a possibility was was wrong. Um, but as we sit here, as we sit here over the, across this table, right. no one's ever going to know. Um, but, you know, they, they, um, th they didn't act as a responsible global actor. So the they wiped, domestic they airlines were shut down. We all know what they did. Domestic airlines were shut down in China, but global airlines continued to fly out yeah. of China. For another three weeks, right? They, they, they ceased travel domestically from Wuhan throughout China, and yet international flights took off for another three weeks. I mean, that's a fact. That's super interesting. Uh, it, it, this is the kind of stuff that on the old Twitter you would be, it, this, this would have never happened, right? With, it, this, this would have been, it, been like a forest falling, uh, falling in the tree and not, yeah, right? I mean, there, there's so many things that are fairly obvious that are just facts, and then you know, we're never going to know if the virus was released. So the, the, the whatever would have indicated that it's, it's gone, destroyed. Yeah. Right. Well, so the bottom line is they're inexorably headed to try for global hegemony and we need, we need to do something. I, I bet we're not doing what we need to do. Well, when you look at their economy, right, they're having a real estate, they're experiencing a real estate class. No way that we just sell to their consumers and they sell to ours and we're all happy. I thought she said that there's enough room in this, in this globe for two I, superpowers. Didn't you say that? I don't understand how, how countries with diametrically opposed value systems can engage in, let's say, meaningful interaction for any long period of time. It just, it's not going to work.